anyone who knows me knows that uh, this topic actually reflects my own personal values. Um, as a business leader, and certainly uh, dean of a great business school in Canada, uh, and as a Canadian citizen, I can think of nothing more important than public service. I weaved public service into my own career uh, from a very early point, whether it was serving on not-for-profit organizations or whether it was serving on some task forces that government asked me to do, um, I always did it. And you know, it's really a choice. It's a choice or a commitment of time that sometimes I wasn't sure that I had the time, but I always made that commitment because to me it was extremely important. And when I look back and I, I look at some of the things that helped me in my life, I really value what I learned in my time in public service. Uh, so if you're thinking about public service and you're trying to make a decision on public service, I encourage you to think yes. It really does make a difference to you and it will make a difference in your career. What did it do? Well, it certainly helped me develop much greater depth and certainly more strength in, as a leader than I think I ever would have had if I had not had that experience. But I think most importantly, it's personal satisfaction. I have known that I have played a little role, certainly very little when compared to uh, the person you're going to hear from shortly, but to know that you can make a difference by doing something in the public service gives you great personal satisfaction. I also believe that government and business are not two solitudes. And I've known some CEOs who said, oh, keep government as far away from you as possible. Well, that's actually wrong. To do that is a big mistake. I think we have a lot to learn from each other, uh, certainly business from government and government from business. And as the next generation of leaders and business leaders, you're in a position to imagine what kind of world do you want to live in? And then you can lend your energy, your skills, <coughs> and your talent to make it that way. It's an incredible opportunity and I encourage each and every one of you to grasp that opportunity. So it's with great enthusiasm and gratitude uh, that we have received a request from Canada's finance minister to speak to you today about the importance of public service. There is no one that can talk to you more and better about it than Minister Flaherty. I know that the ability to create change is one of the factors that drew Minister Flaherty to public service and what a difference he has made. During his public service career, he's introduced major innovations to Canada's tax system and our savings system, which I know is also important to him. He ushered in devices such as the tax-free savings account, registered disability savings plans, pension income splitting, and working income tax benefit. He's probably best known, though, for spearheading Canada's response to the financial global crisis, which has helped our country to stand tall. We stand tall on the world stage. We didn't have banks that collapsed. We are admired by many for our, our regulatory system that no doubt has helped us. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to our finance minister for steering us through that and making Canada certainly feel very proud about how we handled it. Uh, Minister Flaherty was recently awarded Euromoney Magazine's Finance Minister of the Year Award. And Euromoney credits uh, Minister Flaherty with enhancing Canada's reputation for sound fiscal policy while taking full account of social justice and overseeing a strong regulatory regime that has kept the financial sector out of chaos. Minister Flaherty is a third-term member of Parliament for Whitby, Oshawa. He's also governor of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. In 2010, Minister Flaherty was chair of the G7 Finance Ministers and chair of the annual Commonwealth Finance Ministers Meeting. Previously, for more than 10 years, he served as the member of the Provincial Parliament for Whitby Ajax in Ontario. And during his tenure in the Provincial Government, he served as Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance Attorney General and Minister of Labor. He graduated from Princeton University with honors and then graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School. 
He was called to the bar in Ontario with honors and practiced law for more than 20 years before being elected to public office. He is married to Christine Elliott, who just enjoyed a landslide victory in the Ontario provincial election, earning a second term as the Member of Parliament for Whitby Oshawa. Together, they live in Whitby, and in their spare time, they have raised a family of three triplet sons. So I know the Minister is very keen to talk with you, not just at you. So following his presentation, we will ha open the floor to our students uh, to have a, a question period. So on behalf of the faculty, the students, and the staff of the Richard Ivey School of Business, please welcome Minister Flaherty. Thank you, um, Dean Stevenson, and it's good to, uh, good to be here at Ivy and to have a chance to um, say a few things to you today about, uh, about public service. Uh, Dean Stevenson is a great example. Carol is a great example of, um, of a great Canadian who serves her country when she's asked to serve and, and participate. We went through a crisis uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, with respect to a couple of our large Canadian corporations, including General Motors of Canada Limited, and I called Carol and asked her if she would represent Canadians on the board of General Motors internationally, the parent, as we are a major investor, all of us, in, uh, in General Motors. I can tell you as a Conservative, it wasn't my first choice to uh, get into the private sector, but it's turned out to be a pretty good deal uh, for, our, for our country in terms of job preservation. And, uh, and Carol Stevenson has, has done that. She continues in that role. She's also uh, been involved in the review of our public service and compensation, our public service, and many other, many other initiatives. I must say that when I ask Canadians, prominent Canadians from time to time, I know the Prime Minister has the same experience to, to help, to participate, and it's usually for a dollar a year or something like that, it is rare for any Canadian ever to say no. And that's a, that's a great part of our country. I think that Canadians are prepared to offer their time and expertise and issues like that. Anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, some of my personal experience, and I'll talk about uh, public service. I'll try not to go on too long. I'm going back to Europe later this week for another G20 finance ministers meeting. We have lots of meetings together. We're very cozy friends in the G20. We meet, we meet so often. I'm one of the veterans now. I'm the longest serving finance minister in the G, G7. And one of the long, well, the longest in a democracy in the G20, but some of them are, are uh, <laughs> so, not so democratic. Um, and I'm going to start, I think, in Dublin and, and give a speech on, on, on the situation in Europe and the international situation. I'll try not to, the, the Taoiseach in, uh, in Ireland is a, is a friend of mine, the Minister of Finance, and he told me the story recently of the Irish politician who got up in a room like this and was giving a a rather long-winded speech, on and on and on, and some people going, started going out that door and some people over there, and so finally there was just one fellow sitting in front of him. And the politician stopped and he said, I just want to thank you, sir, for your decency, for your courtesy in hearing me out. And the fellow stood up and said to him, he said, don't thank me, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> so I, well, look at that. Anyway. I am happy to be here. Um, this is a room full of important people. You are the people our country needs in the highly competitive and challenging global marketplace of today and tomorrow. Our future success depends on you. You are the leaders of tomorrow. So this afternoon I want to talk a bit about tomorrow, but first uh, looking back a little bit about, about yesterday. I said part of this was personal, and it is. I was, I was raised in a in a household of, um, of eight children. Uh, needless to say, my mother um, kept the house in order and ruled the roost. Among other things, my mother believed firmly in the benefits of cod liver oil for the treatment of various illnesses, in fact, most illnesses. It tasted awful, so my seven brothers and sisters and I would resist at first. But we would relent in the end for two reasons. One, it was actually good for us, and uh, perhaps more importantly, our mother was not to be disobeyed. Now, I am not your mother. I don't have to be obeyed, but I am here today 
to urge you to consider uh, public service that will be good for you. I want you to consider public service as part of your career path. I recommend it knowing from experience that public service will not be easy to take at times, but it will be good for you in the end result. I can offer no greater assurance than that. After taking uh, the good advice of, uh, of my mother, I eventually graduated from high school and went off to university, as Carol has described. I was fortunate to take my undergraduate degree at Princeton. And during that time, it was my privilege to, uh, to attend a speech delivered by, by Robert Kennedy, so you now have a pretty good idea how old I am. Um, his, uh, his own message to my generation was clear. I need you. Your country needs you. The world needs you. You are the best and brightest of your generation. Now today, almost 40 years after I heard Robert Kennedy speak, my message to you is the same. Canada needs you, your skills, your talents, your idealism, your energy, and your enthusiasm, now more than ever. At the same time, you need Canada. Because, as I can tell you, public service is good for you. It will give perspective to your life by expanding your horizons, your thoughts, your view of the world. You will learn that some issues and concerns are more important than others. And this leads to discernment as choices must be made. This perspective will be useful in all aspects of your life. Public service reminds us all that there exists a genuine concept of the public good in the greater public interest. While we value individual liberty and protect it as Canadians, we also maintain a strong tradition of the public good, what is good for society as a whole, on balance, taking into account disparate interests and adopting the longer view. In public service, you will participate in advancing this public good. So public service is good for you. It will give you a greater impact on others and your country. My, uh, my own high school, Loyola High School in Montreal, has as its motto, a man for others. It's an all-boys school. It says that. Um, my, um, my alma mater, uh, Princeton, keeps its motto, Princeton in the nation's service. Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton University before he became president of the United States, had this to say in 1916 to the graduates of the U.S. Naval Academy. He said, I congratulate you that you are going to live your lives under the most stimulating compulsion that any man can feel, the sense not of private duty merely, but of public duty also. And then if you perform that duty, there is a reward awaiting you which is superior to any other reward in this world. That is the affectionate remembrance of your fellow men, their honor, their affection. In many ways, ranging from individual matters to community concerns to national to global issues, the opportunities to be a positive force for others in public service are both plentiful and fulfilling. And they'll make you happier, ultimately. We are, of course, not in the world alone, and our lives are finite. People seek to have an impact on broader public issues, recognizing the intrinsic value of reaching out to others, not only to maintain and reinforce shared common values, but also to create new initiatives and innovations. This societal public good is not incompatible with the private good. Of course, our individual and family responsibilities are, are primary, Yet the desire to accumulate private goods in the end does not lead to satisfaction because, as we all learn eventually, enough is never enough. On that train, some people will always be in the cars ahead. If money was all that mattered to me, I can tell you that I'd still be practicing law in downtown Toronto because I'd be making a lot more money than I am now. But I would have missed out on so many experiences that have enriched my life. And I would have missed out on so many opportunities to shape and implement public policies that, in my opinion, have enriched um, others' lives and made our communities and country 
stronger. You will have opportunities to change the world around you in varying ways and to varying degrees, both large and small. You will get opportunities to use your talents to implement your thoughts and beliefs. In concert with others, accomplishments will follow. Great adventure um, this is, for disappointments and uh, failure will also follow in some cases. Boredom, however, is not on the agenda. Let me tell you one, one little anecdote. One of the most difficult times I've had, certainly as Finance Minister of Canada, was in 2008. In October 2008, we were in the midst of a, uh, of a general election when the recession, uh, the, the global recession, uh, became increasingly evident. It actually, looking back now, started in the last quarter of, of 2008. As I say, we're in the middle of a general election. Had we known that we were going to have a recession imminently, I can assure you the Prime Minister would not have called uh, an election at that time, but that was, the, that was the situation. So I found myself campaigning in my own riding um, in Whitby, Oshawa, during that, that time, juggling an increasing number of phone calls with my uh, G7 finance minister colleagues, with some of the central bankers, as we became more and more aware of the breadth and depth of the worldwide economic crisis. And one of the most surreal moments was on election day itself. We do one of those, one of those things in, uh, in my writing that some politicians do called the Burma shave, where we actually go out, it's a rather foolish thing, but we go out and wave at cars. And uh, this, I don't know if this gets us any votes or not, but, but it, it gets candidates out of the way of the campaign team, so they're not causing trouble with those people who are actually doing all the work in order to, uh, to get you elected. And we do it early in the morning on Election Day, which is our tradition in Whitby, Oshawa. So I was there at 5.30 in the morning on, on the Tuesday morning. I think it was October 14, 2008. And the election, it was Election Day in the dark, waving at, waving at these cars. And then I had to go take an emergency call on my cell phone and go away from the traffic and the noise. I ended up standing on the front steps of a brick store um, just off the highway in Whitby talking to Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury, then and to the then Chancellor of the Exchequer and to the other G7 ministers and the Secretary of the Treasury was explaining to us how he was going to force that day <laughs> the American, the recapitalization of the American banking system. I can tell you that when I was, when I was your age, had anyone told me I'd be one day speaking to the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chancellor of the Exchequer from the steps of a brick store in Whitby at 7 o'clock in the morning, I wouldn't have, have believed it. But this is what could, uh, could await you. You never know in, in public life. In this room, it's conceivable that I'm sure we could have future mayors and future deputy ministers, chairs of school boards, ministers, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and perhaps even a future Canadian Prime Minister. But in order for this to happen, you have to answer the call, the call like the one I heard Bobby Kennedy give a long time ago. Being involved uh, in public service uh, is an honour for me. I know that members of Parliament in all parties in the House of Commons and members of the, of the nonpartisan public service at all levels feel the same way. Public service is good for all of us. It's unlike any other career. It features long hours, relatively low rates of pay, then comparable positions on Bay Street. And it often takes time. It can take decades before you can witness the positive results of your efforts. And some of you uh, might ask, particularly at your stage uh, of, um, of your academic careers, if the hours are long and the pay long, why would I do it? The answer is simple. It is the most satisfying and personally enriching career you will ever find. And that is priceless. Some of your parents, I'm sure all of your parents, will remember Bill Davis. Mr. Davis served as Premier of Ontario from 1971 to 1985. Quite rightly, politicians and commentators of all political persuasions consider him to be one of the great Ontario Premiers of the 20th century. After his retirement from politics, Mr. Davis, who is a lawyer by profession, was offered a position at one of Toronto's leading law firms. The job finally allowed him to realize a sal salary equal to what his fellow law school graduates 
had been making for years while he worked at Queen's Park as a young back backbencher, a cabinet minister, and later party leader and premier. The new job also came with an impressive office and a fine view of Toronto's downtown, much better, I might add, than the view from the premier's office at the uh, Ontario legislature. Two years after accepting that position, which he excelled at, Mr. Davis was interviewed by TV Ontario's Steve Pakin. Stephen, let me tell you something, the former Premier said. This job on the most exciting, interesting day can't touch being Premier of Ontario on the dullest. So let me return to, to my theme of public service being good for you. It will develop your character as you will need courage to act on crucial issues while rejecting the venality and self-interest that frequent public affairs. Character requires pur purposefulness, steadfastness, and as um, our first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, was fond of saying to his cabinet colleagues, look a little ahead, my friends. Character contrasts with short-term celebrity witnessing, as we do, the tendency of celebrities in public life to underachieve and to fail to stay the course. Anyone in this occupation will tell you that working in the public sector is more than simply coming into work every day and finishing a series of tasks. Rather, public service is a higher calling, one which can result in long days and little sleep, but rewards you with the knowledge that rather than working for the interests of a company or a corporation, you work in the interest of every single Canadian. It is something that makes me truly happy. It's um, important to know why this, more than other careers uh, I've had, um, makes me happy. I don't mean to say that I'm happy because the job is easy. It doesn't make me happy because I get to meet so-called uh, important people, and it doesn't make me happy because I see my name in the paper or my face on, on television. It makes me happy because I know that making the decision to enter public service was right. I know that it's right to want to serve your country. It's right to want to help fellow Canadians. It's right to want to work a, for a better, stronger, and more robust country. It's right to say we can do better. And it's right to stand up and be there for Canada. It's good for me, and I think it'll be good for you if you try. You'll be uh, challenged in many dimensions. Your heart and mind will be engaged on public issues for the public good. Public service will also enrich your skills and your resumes, even if you don't decide to work your whole careers in the public sector. Public service offers valuable training opportunities, such as the chance to interact with Canadians from coast to coast or to perform high-tech research alongside the top scientists in Canada. These are skills and experiences in wide demand in the private sector as well. Now, politics, in the sense of standing for or holding a public office, is a form of public service, but it's only one form. There are many others, community groups, local chambers of commerce, environmental organizations, NGOs, local service organizations, Lions Clubs, Rotary, Knights of Columbus, charitable organizations, the Red Cross, cultural entities, libraries, heritage associations, the civil service itself, school boards, church groups, local minor sports organizations. My choice in recent years has been public office. So I'll return to that. Oftentimes the public perception of those who seek or are elected to uh, public office is uh, jaded. Some of this pessimism is earned. The world of politics, like other occupations, does not exclude the self-absorbed or the narrow-minded. While there are necessary yet at least temporarily unpopular decisions that governments need to take and we do take from time to time. Certainly there are some, also there are some disappointing elected persons. The public good, in my view, will be served better if all of us in all walks of life seek more balance in our perspectives. That is the balance that comes with the acceptance of the realization that we are all in this together seeking the public good and that with the exception of some scoundrels to be found in all walks of life, including politics, 
we share that common goal. So the paramount question for all of us, including the media, remains what is the public good for the country? Now almost uh, 100 years ago, one of Canada's great prime ministers, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, addressed a group of young people in Ontario. It was less than a month before he died in February 1919. He admitted that his generation had not solved all of Canada's problems and was leaving much unfinished in their wake. Through public service, Laurier said, Canada's young people would have to face these challenges themselves. And to do so, he left them the following words of advice. He said, let your aim and purpose in good report or ill, in victory or defeat, be so to live, so to strive, so to serve, as to do your part to raise even higher standard of life and living. Now, just as in Laurier's time, my generation doesn't have all the answers. We have done the best we can. The levers of decision making will soon be in your hands. It matters little to me if you are or end up a conservative, liberal, NDP, or Green Party supporter, although I hope you find conservative principles engaging. Um, <laughs> what matters most is that when you uh, complete your studies, that on graduation day you do get engaged in your communities, in your province, and in your country. Because this country is a land of opportunity for public service in these challenging times. Canada is looked to as an example of a country that worked during the recent global economic crisis and a country that has a plan to ensure <coughs> that Canada continues <coughs> excuse me, to work into the future. Being part of shaping that future will be an amazing, enriching experience for any of you who choose to do it. Your country needs you, but it also has much to offer to you. So one more time I will say public service is good for you. You may have noticed that I have not said that public service is your obligation or your duty. Whether it is or it isn't, the choice is yours. I do recommend it as part of your career because public service will make your life exhilarating and satisfying for, among other things, the reasons that I've mentioned. So if you're um, in your life plan, you consider your priorities and, um, and in your thoughts, create space for the fascinating world of public service. I can promise you that if you do, you will be rewarded in ways no other calling grants you. You will become, as Theodore Roosevelt once said, after he retired from politics, and, uh, and I quote, he said, you'll become one of those who knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory nor defeat. So that is the challenge I, um, I leave with you. Answer the call. You will never regret it. Do it for your country. Do it for yourself. Do it for your mother. The cod liver oil is optional. Thank you for being here today. With the coughing going on in the room, I was about ready to prescribe some cod liver oil uh, as your mother. Anyway, uh, we do have some time for questions. Minister Flaherty has graciously uh, accepted to take some questions from our students. We have mics set up on either side of the room there. So if you could go up to the mic and ask your question, um, we can do this for a few minutes. Okay, we've got our first question. <clears throat> I want to just uh, say your name and what uh, program you're in. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Manish, and I'm in HBA2, so that we'll be graduating at the end of this year. Uh, you spoke a lot about how we should get involved for the greater good, and how that's not only applicable to governments, but also in community groups. And what came to mind for me was the most 
recent example of this in the media is a lot of young people, students and recent graduates, getting involved in a movement called Occupy Wall Street. I would love to hear as a public official and somebody in the finance realm how you feel about a movement like that. I think they have a point. I, and I, I think the point is, is increasingly being recognized that uh, particularly, quite frankly, in the United States, uh, less so in Canada, but there's still an issue in Canada, that, the, the, uh, that too much wealth is concentrated in a very small part of the population. And uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is not new. This is something that we, we talked about in back in 2007, 2008, and I remember having this discussion with several of the investment bankers on Wall Street. None of them have their jobs now, come to think of it. But, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, th this was a concern then. In, in the last 10 years of, of economic growth in the United States, before the recession of 2008, there, w there was an increasingly um, unequal distribution of wealth. There was an increasing concentration of wealth in a very small Number of people. So we need to do we need to do better than that. But it's really about making sure there are adequate opportunities um, for for young people um, to engage in the society. The unemployment rate in the United States among young people is of grave concern. It's better in Canada, but it's still a concern in Canada. So I think for those of us in public office and those of us in the private sector, we have to work hard to make sure that the that the opportunities are there for people entering the workforce, so that they get their their initial chance to show what they can do. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Knoll. I'm a biomedical student and an AEO1 student. And my question was, how do you suggest one to become a leader in public service on an international scale? Well, it's good to start as a Canadian. <laughs> um, it is. I mean, we, it, you have an advantage as a, as a Canadian because they love us. Uh, the OECD, at the IMF, at the World Bank, Canadians have built up a, a strong reputation over the years, and more recently, in recent years, in the world of finance and international banking. Uh, we have a very strong reputation, and the Canadian government puts its money where its mouth is. We, we are one of the major funders of the international uh, banking organizations. Uh, there are many of them, including the African Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and many, many of those. You find Canadians... Um, in, in, in those institutions, um, and many of them are, are headquartered in Washington. Their salaries are tax-free generally, by the way, which is a nice, <laughs> nice little perk in Washington. Um, but the, there are great opportunities there, and, and with the education that you're getting, if you wanted to engage in, in that world, I think you'd find it um, rewarding. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Jordan Douglas. I'm in uh, HBA2 as well. Um, I guess along the same lines as uh, Manish's question um, about the uh, well, sort of resulting uh, in the financial crisis, you alluded to it a couple times in your speech, and I know uh, we've discussed it several times um, throughout our courses. Do you feel, um, from your perspective uh, on the Canadian side, did you see the financial crisis as an indictment of uh, deregulation in the financial sector? Um, no, not really. What, what, I, what I saw in, in other countries, and I should say what I see in Canada, we of course are viewed as relatively strong regulators in our financial sector, and we are. Um, but, but the United States had strong regulations too, but you have to, and, and European countries, you have to enforce the regulations. So I make the distinction between regulation and the exercise of regulation, that is supervision. Because we not only have all the rules, but we supervise. Our superintendent of financial institutions, who keeps me informed, and I, she reports to Parliament through me as Minister of Finance, she keeps me informed of what's going on in Canadian financial institutions, with all its imperfections, because not every institution uh, performs uh, without some concerns uh, from time to time. But in the American situation and some of the others, there was a, in my view, um, an uh, insufficient supervision and application of, of the rules. And it led to some, uh, some 
situations like Lehman Brothers, of course, that, that, that were of great consequence. It's fascinating to me. I was in the meetings in 2008, and I saw the Europeans criticizing the Americans after Lehman Brothers. It was amazing. I looked today in the same meetings where the Americans, with a bit of a smile on their face, criticized the Europeans <laughs> for what they were. And there's good old Canada, virtuous Canada, uh, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the middle. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, James Malone, HBA2. So I'm just wondering a little bit more if you can divulge on your transition from corporate to uh, public service. So for those of us who want to enter the public service, I think myself and I think a lot of other students believe that it's important to get experience in industry so that you have some relevant knowledge of what you're going to be doing once you enter politics. So can you talk a little bit about how you made the transition from a lawyer on Bay Street to politics? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know where, to, where to start with that. I mean, you, there are sort of two ways of doing it. You, you can go into the public sector, we're talking about politics, where you can go into it younger and then leave, and some do that. And it is possible to monetize that experience if, if you've had experience in government. If you've been in the public sector, it's certainly possible to monetize that experience. I know even my own staff in Ottawa, I've had several staff leave over the years, and they've all gone on to do pretty well, actually. Some here today thinking of leaving, I'm sure, and going and making some money. <laughs> um, so it can be monetized. Going the other way, from, from a lawyer's life or an investment banker's life or whatever into politics um, is, is a bit of a hit. It's certainly a hit financially, and you have to be prepared for that. So it would be a good idea, if you're thinking of something you might want to do in your in, in middle life or, or whatever, that you... Um, you know, get, uh, get your house in order financially, pay down your mortgage, reduce your debt. And as one of my colleagues used to say, he used to have people come and see him and say, I'm interested in running it for public office, I'd like to be a member of parliament or whatever. And the first question he always asked them is, is your house paid for? So it's not a bad test uh, before you go into public life to make sure you can take the financial hit. Now, the salaries federally are not, you know, uh, terrible. You, you can live on them, particularly in Ottawa. And uh, so, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but it just means that you're not going to drive a Porsche and you're not going to, uh, to live in Rosedale and you're not going to, you know, have, have the fancy kind of high-flying uh, uh, vacations around the world. But um, although we do get a lot of aeroplane points, I travel a lot. And I, <laughs> I do get a lot of aeroplane points. So that is a perk, actually. I'll have to, I'll have to accept that. But it's, it's something you do. And how you do it, like the mechanics of doing it, it, there's no mystery to it. You get involved in raising money for a political party, which lawyers do all the time, or you get, in, you know, get involved in your local riding association wherever you happen to be living, which isn't that hard to do. You do some of the nuts and bolts stuff. You help out in campaigns. Maybe you manage a campaign, um, that kind of thing, for 5, 10, 15 years, and you build up your own credentials um, with people because it's a relationship business. At the, at the end of the day, and um, and then um, you know, with your professional qualifications, people will want you to run, and they'll be thrilled if you uh, if you decide to do it. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Lou, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm an HBA two, and I was wondering if you believe the euro will be here 30 years from now, and if it's justifiable for like a country to separate from the eurozone in order to for the well-being of their own economy. Well, that's a very timely question. Um, I've had lots of discussions about the euro with my colleagues the last, well, the last year and a half. Um, do I think the euro will be here 30 years from now? Yes, because Germany will be here, and Germany wants to keep the euro. And that's that's the bottom line. I mean. I think there has to be progress toward fiscal federalism in, uh, in the uh, European, in the Eurozone, the 17 countries of the, of the Eurozone. Canada's not a bad example by analogy. You know, if you look at Canada, we have traditionally some uh, less well-off provinces and some more well-off provinces. They change over time. Newfoundland and Labrador is now a have province, Ontario not so much. Um, so things change over time, but we support each other through our equalization system. We have fiscal support um, in the Canadian uh, Federation. They, they tried to go in that direction in 1999 in Europe. Germany was pushing the cause of a 
not only a common currency and a common central bank, which they accomplished, but also some sort of fiscal governance or fiscal union, and France resisted. And now that, that issue is back in the forefront. So I think if they take that step, but the currency itself, I think, will, will be there. But they do need that third pillar. You know, you can't have a common currency. You can't make the system work well with a common currency, a common central bank, and you don't have any sort of fiscal governance that's unified, a common treasury. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Nikhil. I'm HB1. Um, further on the European debt crisis, uh, I just wanted to know, um, you know, the, what, what are the repercussions uh, for us as Canadians, but more specifically as us as members of a global community, if Greece defaults and or is dropped from the European Union? Like, wh what, what are the repercussions for us as Canadians in North America? I mean, a lot of people feel we may or may not be included in this crisis, but uh, of course a lot of experts are saying that um, the possibility of a Greek default or Greece being dropped from the euro can have sub substantial global repercussions. So. I mean, I know we all know that you've been very involved in these discussions. So, what are the repercussions for Canada? Well, the, the you know the way the dominoes fall is um, Greece uh, fails, cannot pay its debts, defaults. Um, the banks that have been financing Greece uh, take the hit. They're mainly German and French banks. Um, North American banks. Uh, become increasingly concerned about doing business with European banking counterparties. Credit market starts to freeze up. Credit in North America gets affected. Uh, the credit crisis moves into the real economy, and we have a global recession. That's so, the good news, no, it's not. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you know, that's why we've been pushing the Europeans to deal with Greece. They're not going to kick Greece out, so okay, so then you've got to help Greece restructure. Greece cannot afford to repay its debts. Let's stop kidding ourselves, unless the country is going to be in recession for 20 years. So, but it's a very difficult political question then. You get into a matter of political will and decisiveness, where, which is what I said to my colleagues when we met just two weeks ago in Marseille. I said, you know, you've got to make the political decision in Europe that you're not going to let any of the Eurozone countries fail, fiscally go bankrupt which means that you're going to have to help finance them and recapitalize their banks and recapitalize your own banks who are indebted to those countries. Right? So that's a very big political decision for, for them to make. Those countries, Ireland, Portugal, um, so far, I'm missing one, that have, have gone down the path of default and had to be refinanced, Ireland and Portugal, but their governments have almost immediately been defeated. This is a very difficult thing for political leaders to, to do, to admit fiscal failure, and an election comes along and people punish them. So I'm sure this is on the minds of others in Europe. And just as a second part, um, is a political union in the European Union an actual possibility? Over time, I, I imagine it's an actual possibility, but I, I, would not, I would not bet the house on it because, you know, the concept of sovereignty is very important and there are lots of different cultures you look now even at the fiscal situations I mean uh, Germany the Netherlands Finland Denmark and, and uh, Sweden just to name some are in very different situations than than other countries the United Kingdom's not in the eurozone they're in a, you know but they're going through a, a very serious uh, austerity program you know, we're not thinking of anything like that in Canada. We're not even thinking of an austerity program in Canada. We're staying the course here, but, but they're going through a very serious uh, restructuring. I mean, they're going to lay off 450,000 public servants in the United Kingdom. So taking out, you know, the, the, the disparate situations that those countries are in, I think it's unlikely we'll see that kind of union, but I do think that there, there will have to be some sort of fiscal decision-making mechanism. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, Minister Flaherty. My name is Wesley Thomas. I'm an HBA1. Um, I have a question to you about something that interests me in politics, um, which I call the difference between policy and politics. So you've been in the uh, House of Representatives for such a long time now that I wanted to know your thoughts on how it's different setting economic policy that's sound for long-term goals in a majority parliament as when, or in difference to when it's a minority parliament, and you know there could be an election tomorrow. There could be an election next week, and maybe short-term goals take precedent. Yeah, it's a very it's a very good question, and, and I lived through it um, in the last uh, f six years. But the um, it makes a difference. 
Like, we were pretty good at staying the course and doing what we thought we had to do. But there are some things I wanted to do that we almost did, but at the end of the day did not do, including some tax reform items that would have simplified our system that at the end, the end of the day we decided not to do because we were faced with the question, do we want to fight an election now? And do we want to fight it on that issue? Because we knew the opposition parties, or not, none of them would support us on it. We had no friends. Right? Um, so it makes a difference, and it makes a difference in, in longer term planning. Because all, all the time we had to have you know, a 45 day plan and a longer term plan and try to do both, and they, they were not always reconcilable. So it, it, it makes a difference. It's easier for us now, particularly as, as we're in rocky economic times again with events outside Canada that might affect Canada, that we're able to, to take the steps that we need to take. In favor of, 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 you know, a minority government is not the end of the world. I know we have one in, in Ontario now, now too. And, and there were times, and like this I think goes back to the Canadian character makeup. In, in, the, in the last month of 2008, when we were looking at, I was listening to Canadians, we were looking at putting together a budget. We're going to do the earliest budget in Canadian history on January 27, 2009. We were going to go from running a sizable surplus, paying down public debt, to a big deficit, just like that, because we didn't want to have millions and millions of Canadians out of work, quite frankly. But I went to the Liberals, and I said, this is what we're proposing to do. This is what we've heard around the country. It's big, it's dramatic, it's a huge change. But we think you're listening, too, to Canadians. You're listening to Canadian business. We need to do this. It's dangerous for our country, for the people of our country, if we don't. And we could go into a deep and prolonged recession and have massive unemployment, double-digit unemployment. To their credit, they agreed, and they voted for it. So it can be done. Reasonable people can manage in a, in a minority government, although longer-term planning suffers. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tyler Scro. I'm HBA2. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to Mr. Carney's role in the economic recovery, and specifically um, with interest rates been low for such an extended period of time, and it looks like it's going to remain that way for a while, if not potentially cut. Um, are you concerned as finance minister with the impact that will have on household debt increasing and a potential real estate bubble? I think that with anemic growth we are seeing right now, maybe those two aren't uh, matching up. It's a good question. And as you know, there's some criticism of the European Central Bank for raising interest rates earlier this year. Um, and uh, Governor Carney has not has kept our, our bank rate, at, uh, our central bank rate at 1% uh, this year. It was predicted that he would let it bump up. He and I have a, the Minister of Finance and the Governor of the Bank of Canada have an interesting relationship. It's the only relationship in government where the law says that we must talk to each other, which we do, of course. Even if the law didn't say that, we do, but we don't actually have a choice. We have to talk to each other. So Mark and I talked regularly. Mark used to be the Associate uh, Senior Deputy Minister of Finance when I was the early on in my days as Minister of Finance. So we know each other. We traveled the world together. We know each other very well. And he's a very strong governor of the, of the bank. I, I watched the housing market. As you know, we tightened up the rules on insured mortgages again this year. This is the third time I've done that in the past almost six years now. If we had to, we'd do it again. There's some evidence of, I mean, it's not irrational for people to borrow money when it's so cheap, right? And, and, to, and to have mortgages. We have to remember the standard term in Canada is five years. And people should think down the road and say, where are we going to be five years from now? And if I have a huge mortgage, am I going to be able to manage the, manage the payments on that mortgage and maintain my lifestyle and my family's lifestyle uh, when I have to renew the mortgage some years down, down the road? So. It's a, um, it's a matter of, um, of balance. We want to have the economic growth, which lower interest rates encourage. On the other hand, we don't want to have bubbles. I tell you, right now in Canada, the only, the only bubbly kind of concern I have is in Vancouver. But there's an explanation for that with a lot of, a lot of uh, investment there that is new investment and is in cash. Um, it's not laundered money or anything. It's okay. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's, that doesn't sound right, does it? It's in cash. But it's not, they're not mortgaging with CMHC generally, so it's not a liability ultimately for the, for the government of Canada. But we watch the housing market, and if we had to intervene again to tighten the mortgage rules, we'll do it again. Hi, my name is Anton. I'm a combined law and business student in my last year. 
Uh, and I was just wondering, from your perspective, do you think Canada will ever get a federal securities regulator to replace our current patchwork of provincial regulators? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I, uh, that's been a, a cause of mine since, uh, since I started in this job in, in Jan February 2006. When I looked at it, you know, Diane was in government. We're not always rational in government, but we try to, you try to be rational, right? You try to be a business person when you look at things, be professional in your analysis. And we have, we have the uh, Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, regulating financial institutions. We have the Bank of Canada setting monetary policy. We have the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, we have the Consumer Financial Agency of Canada. All these things, many of these things the Americans have had to create. Uh, since, the, since the crisis, but we don't have, sitting around the table, <coughs> plus the Department of Finance, we don't have uh, the securities regulator. And this is a missing uh, part of the picture that we want to remedy. So early on we decided um, that we would do this. Uh, we've worked together with, uh, we had a couple of panels look at it for us. Tom Hawken from London led the most, uh, the panel that, that we created and, and did a great job. He's now our, our uh, director, executive director at the International Monetary Fund in, in Washington. Um, he, his group did a really good job. We followed their recommendations. We negotiated with the provinces. We have a group of 10 provinces and territories working with our transition office. Um, the Quebec government challenged our proposal <coughs> in, by doing a reference to the Quebec Court of Appeal. Um, so we did a reference, and the Alberta government did the same thing, the Alberta Court of Appeal although their new premier, I understand, supports a national securities regulator, so Canada gets complicated, you know, with elections changing who's in charge. Um, we, we did a reference to the Supreme Court of Canada. It was argued in April. We expect to hear from the Supreme Court of Canada before too long, hopefully quite soon. Usually it's six months or so with the Supreme Court of Canada, but it's up to them. And uh, we have a transition office in place. We have most of the regulations done. We're, we'll be ready to go next year um, with a national securities regulator assuming that the, we have the jurisdiction to do it, which we'll hear from, uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before I ask uh, one of our HBA1 students, uh, Richard Ruggiero, who, by the way, also worked in the minister's office, so has already answered the call public service, to come and say an official welcome. I realize that I neglected to introduce a couple of uh, people here who are, are great public servants who you might want to speak to afterwards. Uh, one is Diane Cunningham. Diane reads, leads our Lawrence Center here at Ivy. And Diane was a cabinet minister in the Ontario government for many years. In fact, had the ministry responsible for training colleges and universities. And Dr. Kelly Leach. Uh, Kelly is recently elected uh, to the federal government, and she was uh, cross-appointed between the School of Medicine and Ivy, and led our um, Ivy Center for Innovation and Health. So welcome to both of you, and I'm sure you'd be happy to answer any more questions. So Richard, could I call, oh, and last but certainly not least, our president is here, Dr. Amit Shakma. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, when I told him uh, that Minister Flaherty was coming, he said, I really want to come, and not just to say hello, I want to hear the lecture. So I know that he believes very strongly in public service and uh, encourages all of us to get involved in public service, so thank you for coming. And now Richard. Minister Flaherty, on behalf of all of Ivy, thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. It is truly an honor to have the, our finance minister of our country to come speak to us here at Ivy. But more importantly, minister, thank you for speaking to us about an alternative career path from, from the standard uh, that we hear, we hear so much of here at Ivy, of finance and consulting. Thank you for talking to us <laughs> about the public service and your, your experience with it and how it can be good for us too. 